Introduction to Quantum Information Processing. Welcome to Lecture 10. In this lecture, we are going to investigate the phase estimation problem, which involves finding the eigenvalue of an unknown unitary operation given as a black box. This is an abstract problem that turns out to be a powerful algorithmic primitive. Let's start with this simple example. Suppose u is a unitary operation acting on n qubits, and ket psi is an n qubit quantum state that happens to be an eigenvector of u with eigenvalue either plus 1 or minus 1. Now suppose that we are given a controlled u gate, and suppose that we are also given n qubits that are in state psi. We are given no other information about u. Our controlled U gate is essentially a black box. Also, we are given no information about what the state Psi actually is. The only information that we have is the promise that Psi is an eigenvector of U with eigenvalue lambda that's either plus one or minus one. Our goal is to determine from this the eigenvalue lambda. That is, whether lambda is plus one or minus one. It turns out that we can solve this problem by making just one single query to the controlled U gate. I'd like you to think about how this can be done. That is, I'd like you to come up with a quantum circuit that produces the answer. What state should you set the control qubit to? What state should you set the n target qubits to? Now is a good time to pause the video to think about this. Okay, so how did that go? Did you come up with a quantum circuit for this? If you did not, then I'd like to urge you to try again. The solution is a pretty simple circuit, and it's similar to the very first quantum algorithm that we saw for Deutsch's problem back in lecture six. So please pause the video now and give it another shot. Okay, let's see a solution. Did you come up with this circuit? Here's how it works. The first Hadamard puts the control qubit into superposition. Next, notice what the control du gate does. The ket zero tensor psi term in the superposition does not change, but the ket one tensor psi term changes to ket one tensor u of psi. This is just following the definition of a controlled u gate. And since psi is an eigenvector of u with eigenvalue lambda, we can write the state like this. And the state simplifies to this. Notice that the control qubit is either the plus state or the minus state, depending on the sign of lambda. Therefore, the second Hadamard gate permits us to distinguish between the two cases, that is, between the plus state and the minus state, by a measurement in the computational basis. We have just solved a special case of the phase estimation problem. I will show you how the general case is defined and then we'll see that it turns out not to be that much harder than this case to solve. In order to define the phase estimation problem in full generality, we first need to extend our notion of a controlled U-gate. Here's a review of what a standard controlled U-gate is. The unitary matrix is this block matrix with two blocks on the diagonal, identity and U. When the control qubit is in computational basis state ket A, we can write the output state of the target qubit succinctly as u to the power A psi. u to the zero is identity, which means do nothing, and u to the one is just u, which means apply u. So in the computational basis, the control qubit is a number which indicates how many times u should be applied to the target, zero times or one time. 
We can define a more general type of a controlled ugate where there are L control qubits and the number of times that U is applied is an L bit integer. In this case, U can be applied zero times, U can be applied once, twice, three times, all the way up to two to the L minus one times. For example, if L is five and the control qubits are in state ket 11010, then U gets applied 26 times. Why 26? Well, because 11010 is the number 26 in binary. This is what the unitary matrix of this kind of controlled U gate looks like. The blocks along the diagonal are powers of U. Identity, U, U squared, U cubed, all the way up to U to the power 2 to the L minus 1. Okay, so we've defined a more general type of controlled gate. Let's call this a multiplicity controlled U gate. In the computational basis, the state of the control qubits specifies how many times U should be applied. As an aside, I want to distinguish this kind of gate from a different generalization of a controlled U that we saw previously in the Toffoli gate. For the Toffoli gate, there are two control qubits, and the unitary U is the poly X gate, also called the NOT gate. For the Toffoli gate, the NOT is applied to the target qubit if and only if both control qubits are one. Our notation distinguishes between these controlled gates and our multiplicity controlled gate. When we have a separate dot at each control qubit, that means that the U gets applied once if and only if all the control qubits are in state ket1, and otherwise nothing happens. So the unitary matrix looks like this, with identity matrices along all of the diagonal except one U in the last block. Our multiplicity controlled U gates are denoted differently from this, with just one single dot stretched out so as to cover all the control qubits. Now we can define the phase estimation problem in generality. U is an unknown unitary operation acting on n qubits, and psi is an eigenvector of U. But now the eigenvalue is not restricted to being plus one or minus one. The eigenvalue can be any complex number on the unit circle. So the eigenvalue is of the form e to the two pi i phi, where phi can be any real number between zero and one. In the phase estimation problem, we are given a black box for a multiplicity controlled U gate with L control qubits. And we're also given one copy of the state psi, the eigenvector of u. The goal is to determine the parameter phi. Since phi can take on a continuum of values, specifying it exactly would take infinitely many bits. The actual output that we'll require is just an L-bit approximation of the value of phi. That's the definition of the phase estimation problem. There's an exact case of this where phi is an L-bit binary fraction. This case is simpler to work with than the general case. An L-bit binary fraction means phi is a rational number with 2 to the L in the denominator and an integer a between 0 and 2 to the L minus 1 in the numerator. An equivalent way of saying this is that the binary representation of phi can be written exactly with only L bits occurring after the radix point. The general case is where phi is arbitrary. For example, if phi is one third, then the binary representation is 0 0.01010101, where the zero one pattern repeats forever. That's not a binary fraction for any L. The 8-bit approximation of this number is just 01010101. 1, 1, 1, 1. 
It's one-third rounded down to the closest 8-bit binary fraction. The 7-bit approximation of this number is 0 0.0101011. Note the last bit is 1, not 0, because we round it up to the closest 7-bit binary fraction. We always round phi towards the L-bit binary number that's closest. Sometimes that means rounding down, and sometimes that means rounding up. For our applications, we will want the general case of phase estimation, but it's conceptually useful to first solve this problem in the exact case. So let's go ahead and solve the exact case. This will be quite easy. In the exact case, the parameter phi is a binary rational number where the denominator is 2 to the L, and the numerator is an integer a between 0 and 2 to the L minus 1. This means that the eigenvalue e to the 2 pi i phi can be written as omega to the a, where omega is a primitive 2 to the lth root of unity. It clarifies things to think of the eigenvalue as omega to the a in this manner. Note that the goal of determining the eigenvalue parameter phi is now equivalent to determining the value of the number a. By the way, the L equals 1 version of the exact case is that simple example that we solved at the very beginning of this lecture. And in that case, omega is minus 1. We'll start by putting the control qubits into a uniform superposition of all computational basis states on L qubits which is accomplished by L Hadamard transforms. And we'll perform the multiplicity controlled U gate. What is the output state of this quantum circuit so far? Just before the query, the state is the uniform superposition of L qubit computational basis states, and the target state is ket psi. We can think of the control qubits as numbers between 0 and 2 to the L minus 1. Now, what happens when the multiplicity controlled U gate is applied? For each term in the superposition, the value in the first part determines how many times U is applied to the second part. When it's 0, U does not get applied at all. When it's 1, U is applied. When it's 2, u squared is applied, when it's 3, u cubed is applied, and so on. Since psi is an eigenvector of u with eigenvalue omega to the a, that means each time u is applied, the effect is to add a phase of omega to the a. So the phases are 1, omega to the a, omega to the 2a, omega to the 3a, all the way up to omega to the power 2 to the L minus 1 A. Okay, this is the state produced by this circuit. Now, do you recognize this state? Does it remind you of a state that has come up in recent lectures? Please feel free to pause now and think about this. Okay. So that state is the Fourier basis state of f2 to the l of ket a. It's the same state that arises if we apply the Fourier transform to ket a. Remember that our goal is to determine a. The fact that the Fourier basis states with the different a's are orthogonal is a good sign. It means that they are distinguishable in principle but we can also explicitly compute the value of a using a polynomial number of gates. Can you see how? Well, we use the inverse Fourier transform. If we apply the inverse Fourier transform to the state f of ket a, then you get ket a. So this is our phase estimation algorithm for the exact case. It determines a, the numerator of the binary fraction for phi, or equivalently, the L bits of the binary representation of phi. Note that the algorithm makes only one query, and all the other operations in the algorithm, the gray boxes, 
can be implemented with a polynomial number of 1 and 2 qubit gates. Polynomial with respect to L, the number of control qubits. Now, what happens if we use the same algorithm for the general case, where phi can be any real number between 0 and 1? Recall that in that case, we need to determine the L-bit binary number that best approximates the true value of phi. We can write phi this way as an L-bit binary fraction plus a quantity delta, where delta represents the remaining bits that get rounded up or down. If phi gets rounded down, then delta is positive. If phi gets rounded up, then delta is negative. The absolute value of delta is small. It's at most 1 over 2 to the L plus 1. If delta is 0, we are in the exact case. Let's trace through what this circuit does when delta is not 0. Since psi is an eigenvalue of u, the second register, the last n qubits, doesn't change states. All the action is with the first register the first L qubits. Just before the inverse Fourier transform, the state is this. Remember that e to the 2 pi i phi in the parentheses is the eigenvalue of u. And we can substitute in our expression for phi an L-bit binary fraction plus delta. We can factor out a phase factor related to delta. I'm highlighting in bright red where the state deviates from the Fourier basis state that arose in the exact case. When delta is zero, this is the Fourier basis state. Now we apply the inverse Fourier transform to the state, which is this. Looking at this expression, it helps to note that the rightmost parentheses contains the expression for the inverse Fourier transform of ket b. With some simple rearranging, the expression looks like this. That's the state after the inverse Fourier transform. The correct outcome for the phase estimation problem is a. What's the probability that measuring this state results in outcome a? To figure this out, we look at the amplitude of the ket a term in this expression. What's the amplitude of ket a? Notice that if we substitute a for c, then the factor omega to the b a minus c simplifies to omega to the 0, which is 1. So we are left with this sum. As a reality check, what is this sum in the exact case, where delta is 0? Can you see why it's 1? This makes sense, because for the exact case, we've already seen that the measurement outcome is A for sure. For the general case, we are interested in the absolute value of this sum. And note that delta is less than 1 over 2 to the L plus 1. So we need to study this sum. To summarize where we are, the phase parameter is the binary fraction a over 2 to the l plus delta, where the absolute value of delta is at most 1 over 2 to the l plus 1. The correct output is a, and this sum is the amplitude of ket a for the state that our circuit constructs. The success probability is the absolute value of this amplitude squared. It may be less than 1, but we will show that it's not too small. It's lower bounded by a constant. At first glance, the sum may look daunting. But there's a closed form expression for it. Can you see what it is? Notice that this sum is a geometric series. Do you remember the formula for the sum of a geometric series? Using that formula, we can express our amplitude as this expression. What we're going to do now is use some simple geometric reasoning to show that the absolute value of this sum is at least 
2 over pi. To lower bound the expression, we'll show that the numerator is not too small and the denominator is not too large. First, let's show that the denominator is not too large. Here are 1 and e to the 2 pi i delta as points in the complex plane. The length of the red line segment is the absolute value of the difference between these quantities. The length of the red line is upper bounded by the arc length between the two points, which is 2 pi delta. Therefore, 2 pi delta is an upper bound of the denominator. Next, we'll lower bound the numerator. Again, we have the absolute value of the distance between two numbers in the complex plane, which is the length of the red line. Let us also consider the arc length between the two points. Note that the arc length is not a lower bound of the distance. It's longer than the line segment. Think of the arc length as the length of the line times some stretch factor. How big is the stretch factor? If the line segment is short, then the stretch factor is just slightly larger than 1. In that case, the line and arc have almost the same length. But the line and arc can be long. The extremal case is when delta is as large as possible, 1 over 2 to the L plus 1. In that case, the length of the line is 2, and the length of the arc is pi. So the stretch factor is pi over 2. That's the maximum stretch factor that can occur. Therefore, we can lower bound the length of the line by the arc length as long as we multiply the arc length by the inverse of the stretch factor. Multiplying the arc length by the reciprocal of the maximum stretch factor compensates for how much longer the arc length can be than the line segment. Therefore, the numerator is at least 4 delta times 2 to the L. Now we can substitute in our bounds for the numerator and the denominator. And what we get simplifies to 2 over pi. So the absolute value of the amplitude of the correct outcome is 2 over pi. That means that if we measure in the computational basis, we get the correct answer A with probability at least the square of that, which is 4 over pi squared. That's slightly more than 40%. This might not seem like a very high success probability, but for our purposes, what's important is that it's a constant. In the context where we will use phase estimation to achieve something else, such as to factor a number, we will be able to amplify the success probability by repeating the entire process a few times. In summary, the phase estimation problem is defined as follows. U is an unknown unitary operation on n qubits. Ket psi is an eigenvector of U with eigenvalue e to the 2 pi i phi, where phi is any real number between 0 and 1. The goal is to get an L-bit estimate of phi using a black box for an L-bit multiplicity controlled U-gate. This is the quantum algorithm, where the inverse Fourier transform can be computed using order L-squared elementary gates. The output succeeds with probability at least 4 over pi squared in the general case and always succeeds when phi is an L-bit binary fraction. Before ending the lecture, I'd like to bring your attention to a slightly different scenario. Suppose that instead of being given an eigenvector, we're given a superposition of two eigenvectors with different eigenvalues. More specifically, suppose that the state that we're provided with is of the form alpha 1 psi 1 plus alpha 2 psi 2, where psi 1 has eigenvalue e to the 2 pi i 
phi 1, and psi 2 has eigenvalue e to the 2 pi i phi 2. What happens if we run our phase estimation algorithm using this state in the target register? For the exact case, it's not too hard to show that the result is phi 1 with probability the absolute value of alpha 1 squared and phi 2 with probability the absolute value of alpha 2 squared. So it's as if instead of a superposition, we had just set the target to psi 1 with probability alpha 1 squared and psi 2 with probability alpha 2 squared. That's for the exact case. For the general case, it's similar with the statement of the result being modified to include the qualification with success probability at least 4 over pi squared. And although I've described the case of a superposition of two eigenvectors, there's nothing so special about two. There are similar results for the cases of superpositions of more than two eigenvectors. Okay, let's end the lecture now.